Okay. All right. I was having I was having some more of my ZD today. Been struggling for ten minutes to get into this thing. Okay. How about some calculus? New new assignments up there for you, by the way. Um, screen share. New fiasco here, I'm sure. Screen share. All right. Okay, chapter four, calculus. Um, chapter four, calculus. Now what I'm gonna do here, rather than keep this annoying habit of like, what do you see on the screen? I'm gonna say what I think is up there, chapter four, calculus. And if you don't see that immediately, you know, click in there, all right? All right, we're gonna to go to integrals, the second half of calculus. I hope that the thing on, on derivatives gave you a better idea what a derivative is, especially doing it numerically. And I know I've talked to people about this in the past that, you know, the, um, when you can understand things numerically, do them discreetly, you, your, your depth of understanding increases greatly. The derivative, for instance, is something that I believe every human should understand, could understand. Now, they don't want to, they don't want to listen to all this, you know, math jargon that goes with it. I'll agree with you there, but everyone can understand that. The same thing with an integral, and it's all based on the same thing of a finite difference. Let's say you have a function in time. Let's say you have a function in time like this. And let's say that is the rate of change. Okay, you're, so you're given the rate of change and, and it's like a finite difference and you wanna find what the function was. So with derivatives, with derivatives, you were given the function and this was the question mark. Now, the opposite. You're given the rate of change and you have to determine the function from it. So going up the interstate, for instance, you know, I talked about velocity. You know, you can measure your distance between mile markers. Now, let's say your odometer was broken. You don't have a way to measure how far you've gone, but your speedometer works. See, now you can take your rate of change over various times. Okay, and really it all comes down still using this notion of a finite difference. One thing you can do is, is you wanna know, so you say, you know that G of T. So you say, well, I'll go from a starting, and, and let's say you're given the starting point, you go from a known starting point, um, you know, you go from a known starting point up to some unknown point. Well, you do the algebra on this, and that gives you an estimate of where you're going using a finite difference using a, you know, a, a numerical derivative. Now, it might be that things change so much over the course of your trip that one average is not good enough. What you might need to do is measure, you know, is take your G, at, you know, your rate of change at, you know, several times and add them together, thereby coming up with this sum the so-called Ryman sum. And where's the little picture that goes with it? These journal, these people, this book won't put my pictures where I wanted them. But nevertheless, you're now you're saying, you're just G of, G of, A, of T is given to you, you see, the solid black line. So what you do is you evaluate it at say a point over an interval. And so you take G at time one times the interval time one, time one to time zero, and number two, and number three, dot, 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 up to end. And now, rather than one big crude finite difference across the whole thing, in this particular case, you work yourself in the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or seven little steps. You can see though, that even this looks stair-steppy. So the way you can do it, instead of seven steps, go in 10,000 steps, go into 10,000 tiny, tiny little steps. 
and thereby giving yourself something that looks more like this, which in fact is the integral. The area under this curve is the integral. So as you see, you can do this from, um, the, the, the classic is predict, predict displacement knowing velocity. Well, say you don't have this, but you've got velocity data at discrete times, but you add them up. That is like this little picture shows the, the Ryman sum, I guess we will call that sometime. But it has this interpretation here. And that leads us to then a summary of calculus, which I want to go to next, and then I'll go back to some of the other ones. Eh, my little favorite picture was done upside down and sideways, so I have to go to um I have to go to you know, I have to escape that and go view uh rotate, 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 there it is. Okay, there we go. Oh. I know you've been through three or four courses in calculus, why so cover calculus, et cetera. And, and the reason being, I think that many students don't do it at the level I want. And I, of course, some of you might have made a D or C or something not so good, but there's a lot of students I've talked to and, and, and their understanding is not where I want it to be. And I said, well, how'd you do in your calculus? Well, I made an A minus or an A. So there's a lot of students who are, because they're good students and they work hard and they you know did what they were supposed to do made an a but it's not a good enough a so here we go we've got derivatives and integrals these are the two branches of calculus right the two things now here is the concept kind of stuff The concept of a derivative is, if I give you some data or a function f, you are supposed to estimate for me the time rate of change or the derivative with x or the derivative with t. Most of the time in engineering, we're taking derivatives with time or derivatives with x, where most of the time we'll probably take derivatives with time in this course. Okay, so that's the idea. You find this. On the other hand, On the other hand, I want all that encapsulated. Now, the opposite is I'll give you the G, you find for me the F. You see the, the exchange of the I know it and I don't know it, question mark in the check. And sometimes this is called the antiderivative, which sounds like sort of a negative thing. I don't know why I always like that name, but actually it makes sense, the derivative or it's antiderivative, you know. Now, I think what's I think what's the problem with calculus is this here. And this is strict and it's mathematic and it's a crazy limit. Uh, you know, we say uh, day one calculus in high school, whatever. Hello, my name is Mrs. Polson or whatever yours was named. And da da da. And a derivative is the limit of all. It's like what? And I think that. If we went to this line first and truly understood a numerical approximation first, then to tell somebody, look, do a little bit more accurate, little, take measurements over a little smaller time steps, more, more accurate, then it would make sense what we're doing here. And so here's what we're doing. The derivative is approximated as a finite difference. This one happens to be a forward difference, but you could have used a backwards or centered kind of thing. Um, because you're going to take the limit is very small steps. You does I don't know that it matters too much. Well, okay. Anyway, we've been we've been doing a week of this, and I, hopefully that makes sense to you. But now we see we rearrange this information in these little steps, and now we get the Riemann sum over here, which is a summation of these little steps. And so I think this box here is the key to understanding calculus and really understanding it not just at a level to make an A in a calculus course, at a higher level than that. Then you can understand that this thing we call, see, we take the, the approximation, this thing we call the derivative, this D, F, D, T, a strange notation, is this same 
discrete concept that's very understandable for anybody measuring distance and time, but just do it under small, just do it on the tiniest little time step you can to make it accurate. And fortunately down here, Thank goodness, the geometric interpretation, if you're a visual learner like myself, the, the concept of a derivative then, in fact, is the slope of the curve at that point, where the finite difference is the slope of some other secret might have been. Thank goodness. And then, you know, over here on the integral parts, well, you rearrange this, you get the little fi your finite sum. Now you get this very strange concept of taking the limit of delta t goes to zero. Like what? Like you gave me I understood it when you gave me 10 velocity measurements and 10 times I'd added the numbers up, but now what I don't have those. I know, but theoretically, you're supposed to get not just 10 measurements or 100 measurements, you're supposed to be able to take an infinite number of them over tiny, tiny little, little steps and do this. And now here, this, I think the, the abstraction in this box is what, why calculus is not understood at the level I would like it to be understood. You've got to go to the previous box. You, this strange snake, this S looking like a, it's like a sum. And I think it was chosen because this looks like a sum like thing. And, but what it means is this limit, like what the hell? I don't have a watch that goes down to zero time can measure a femtosecond or a whatever it is. And I don't have, I can't possibly make the measurements every nano or femtosecond. So this is an abstraction. Start here completely before you go here. We in this course are going to do this box. We're not going to do this. This is what you do in normal calculus. And thank goodness, oh, praise the whatever. Thank goodness that this thing has a geometric interpretation of the area under the curve because the little boxes now, as you take an infinite number of them, now they the seven boxes I showed you in the diagram, they look jerky. They look, you can clearly see the inaccuracy. But when you have a trillion of them, the inaccuracy for all intents and purposes is gone. And when you have an infinite number of them, the, if somehow you could do that, the, the error is completely gone and you get a perfect answer. Nice, nice, nice. So with that, then, Oh, we've got to go back to, got to go back to matter, rotate um, the other way. Okay, so therefore, where's my little picture? Okay, going back to this picture. So this is whatever that one count, seven, seven little rectangles, and you can see seven. Would you agree with me if I had 7,000 rectangles, the jerkiness would look be almost imperceptible, and the answer would be very good. That is, it is the integral under this, the integral of this curve is the summation of these rectangles approximately. In this particular case, the numerical approximation using the seven rectangles would be what? Too high, wouldn't it? You can clearly see it's got too much. It's got a little too much in a lot of places. You could take the center point, do center differences. You could take the backward point. But as you take finer and finer measurements, it goes like that, you see? And with that picture in mind, things like the mean value theorem, you don't need to memorize this anymore. This should become quite obvious from this picture here. If you want the integral of this function between A and B, doesn't it make sense if you get an appropriate average and take the area of that rectangle? Area of a rectangle is very easy, right? It's the base times the height. So it would be B minus A times this. The area under this curve here, gosh knows what, it's all up and down, hooky and thing. But an appropriate mean value can give a rectangle that's exactly the, 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 the interval. So now the mean value theorem, I think, hopefully, it should make complete sense, not something you memorize. Integration by parts. Integration by parts, same thing. We've got some elaborate formula, but think of it, think of discrete steps. Think of the change of a product of two functions, like this, the product rule. Rearrange it and integrate both sides. 
And now, the integration by parts formula should make sense. If I asked you to pop off off the top of your head, the integration by parts formula here. And you go, uh, well, I don't blame you. It's, it's a, bunch of, a whole bunch of symbols like this, if you don't visualize them or know where they came from, it's very hard to memorize. It's like memorizing random symbols. But if you know where they came from, and if and they all come from this one idea of a finite difference and adding finite, they all come from that. They all come from one basic little picture with pulses, okay? Then you can take a piece of paper and in a, in a minute or two or whatever, redrive this formula for yourself. Okay, you can redrive it for yourself. Understand it with the, with the realization about the little discrete differences and finite differences and things, and you'll be not only derive it, but you'll be confident that you've got a correct derivation where you have the integration by parts. And you have, in general, you can um, extend that to the divergence theorem in a multidimensional problem. It's used a lot. Maybe. So, just one more example why knowing concepts is so much important than memorizing a formula. Not that not, not, not saying that integration by parts is the most important thing about calculus. It's it's one of the things that can be very useful at times, but it's not the main thing. But my point here is so all this stuff, mean value, integration by parts, the next thing is Leibniz rule, even worse, is if you understand a basic, basic concept that any human can understand, you can derive it yourself. And you know, this thing about patterns, like there was an experiment, they did a, did a test that I thought was very interesting. Anybody play chess? You know, it's that game of the pieces you move around. But they did this experiment and they took a, a grandmaster, a chess grandmaster, and they part way into a game enough somewhere there was a good bit of interaction of the pieces but still say two-thirds of the pieces were left and and whatever so whatever complicated looking chessboard okay and they gave the grand master something like two minutes to look and re look and memorize the board then they took the board away and gave him a bunch of chess pieces and asked him to create the board again and he's able to do it perfectly he's one of the best chess players in the world they repeated the experiment with the same number of pieces still in play, but they put the pieces randomly on the board and the chess master could no longer repeat what he just looked at because it had no patterns to him. When he looked at the original chess game, it matched patterns that were ingrained in his mind. It matched, it matched intelligence, but just randomly. So if equations like this look like randomness to you, of course you don't remember what they are. Of course you don't understand them. If you see patterns in them, if you see logic, then they make complete sense. If this little picture makes sense, adding up tons of them makes sense, and this little graph makes sense. So, there's this obscene word, okay, and I'm not supposed to use language like this in a, in a classroom, okay? So you can report me if I say this, but there's this term, and I want to say it once because it is really vulgar, is plug and chug. You'll never hear me say it again, okay? Sorry about the obscenity here. Okay, another, another example of this, and we probably won't use this too much, so I'm not going to pour over it, but the Leibniz rule, Upon occasion in calculus, and we won't in this course, you'll need to know this fancy interval. If you have a function of x in time and you integrate in one of the variables, say x, and you integrate and stuff changes with time, not only the integrand, but the limits of integration change with time. This comes up in fluid mechanics, this comes up in places, and it's in my notes if you happen to need it. But, you know, it's, I, I derived it by insight and I came up with this fancy formula here. This is another example of a fancy formula that if I, if I gave you five minutes and memorize it, few people could do it. But if I gave you an appropriate amount of time and some logic behind it, you could derive it. And it's a beautiful thing to derive. And this particular one, 
is sort of dear to my heart because I can remember um, way back, I was in, I think I was in graduate school, I was in graduate school and you know, I'd gone home to see my parents over Thanksgiving or something like that and I had some homework and I didn't have my book and I need Leibniz rule. And I was like, oh God, it's, and I sat there with a piece of paper and struggled with it and derived it myself. And I went, oh my goodness, you know, I, I just again from these basic ideas of little, little pieces, you know, and um, that was kind of a watershed moment. It's like, oh, the fact it's long doesn't matter. You know, if you give me a short formula and it's just randomness to me, I can't tell you. But this one I could repeat to you because it makes sense, not because I'm so good at memorizing things. Anyway, that's calculus. You've seen all this calculus before. One of my favorites, as you know, is the beloved step function. There it is, the step function. Um, another, and, and all of its children and grandchildren. The, the step function is the granddaddy. Right? And um, the pulse is, is one of its one of its children. So there's the step function. From it, you can make the pulse. Notice this thing is used a lot, I think, or so could be used a lot. It is used a lot. How do you make a How do you make this pulse? Does everybody agree with this picture here? That that thing is equal to one that starts here the whole way, minus one over here. It's equal to that one, minus that one. This is a key idea in building hard things from easy th easier earth things, you know. So here we, we start with something, we'll, we'll call this easy the pulse, I mean the uh, step. And from the step, we wanna build a pulse. So what we do is we turn a step on and turn a step off and we end up with here, which means a, a pulse function can be obtained as the difference in two steps. Right? Where's the full formula up here? There it is up here. This is kind of crazy, guys. We can put the pictures right. I want the picture right where the formula is, but it wouldn't do it for me. Okay, so, but there, so see this idea here? That's why I'm able to take two step functions to factor. Here is the logic. I mean, it's it's a logical statement, you know, like that. That's the way you'd say it in English. I mean, that's what the step function is. The way you'd say the step function in English is if the argument's negative, it's zero, else it's a one. And it's called the step function. So it's a logical function, really. For notes, you can build lots of things. You can integrate it, of course, you get a ramp. You can um, look at various things like that, including the delta functions, one of my all-time favorites. Right. Now, what I want to do here is, you have a homework problem. I just released it earlier, not, not too long ago, released the problem itself, and we'll come up with a quiz. We haven't posted a quiz concerning it yet. But, Here, for instance, let's, let's get that ribbon thing out of the way. It doesn't look too nice. Let's see. I don't want you to see that. I must view uh, without the uh, thing here. Okay, okay let, let's take a real rudimentary problem here. Problem four or five from the book. And this one well, should help you do the first problem in a moment. The function at hand is the following. It's this, as you see it, it's six for a while, but it's nothing. Okay. What is the integral of that function between zero and three? And notice the use of the dummy variables. Some people put it as T prime. Prime often means derivative, so I don't use that. I pretty much use the little sub zero, that's not a, that's not a, it's an O, a sub O, rather sub zero, as my dummy variable of integration. But note, I see even esteemed professors write this.
like this. And I grit my teeth when I see that. That's just, just, it's horrible, horrible. This is horrible. And I want to get rid of that. I want to undo, I want to undo that. Hold on this. Okay. See, T is there. You can't use it. You can't have several meanings for the same symbol in the same equation. Okay. So it's called a dummy variable. And it has to be anything but the variables that are used. You can't choose that. You can't choose other parameters if they existed. But anyway, let's, let's talk about this first case. Via chat or piping in or speaking up, what do you think the answer is? Let's see what do we got here. Where the heck's in my chats? I don't know where they are. I don't have chats all in between. Chat. Yeah. Chat. Eighteen. We got an answer. Eighteen. Who votes for this correct answer? And how might we get that correct answer? Let me see. No, 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 no. Too far. I don't want to do that. There. Okay. Um, now I want to evaluate. Now note when when time is between zero and three, the function is always a six. So you can bring a six outside the integral. This panel's in my way. Um, so see when a constant can come out and then you're integrating time to zero, so you get 18. Now, how about this one? So that turned out to be six times three, right? So this should be six times eight, right? 48. Who votes for the wrong answer, 48? I hope you're all not seeing this stupid little screen down here below that I mean, it's in my way. I can't get to things. Um, what do the chat say? We got anything uh, in there? Oh, there's a chat. Where's the chat nine? 24. Who agrees with the correct answer? 24. And here you see that the interval from zero to eight, the function changes, changes course. You see, zero to eight, it's not one thing the whole way. It's something for a while and something else for a while. So we, and, and a, um, a suggestion, a lifetime suggestion in calculus, or in most everything, if, if you have something that's in two distinct parts, I suggest you evaluate it as two distinct parts. You do the, do the part one, part two. Don't try to do it all in one big fell swoop. You can put it into a final formula. So in other words, between zero and four, it's one thing between four and eight. So here you go. I'm, I'm breaking my interval between zero and four and between four and eight. In the zero to four, six comes outside. In the zero to eight, zero comes outside. Therefore, we come up with the correct answer, 24. Now, on to this one. What do y'all think about that one? What was on my little chats? Do I have any, have anybody even brave enough on this one? How many, how many, how many vote for the incorrect answer that it's still always 24? This right here, to me, this question right here, 
often separates the people that made an A in calc that made an A in calculus, the not so good A, and those that really understood it and made a good A. As I said, time, notice that time is up in here, right? So time can be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, right? Time can be all those. You're, you're supposed to put in time like two or three or four or whatever, and it's supposed to make an answer. Note it's not always 24. So you, what you really need to do, because it's in multiple parts, you need to think of it in multiple parts. For, for instance, when time is less than four, it's clearly always a six, right? So when time is less than four, it's always a six, but now you integrate time. So it's 6t, it's, it's 6t. Let's see if that formula works. Over here, when time was three, we said it was 18. Put in a three and put a three in right there. What do you get? 18, right? So what it does is basically the integral end of the curve, you integrate from here to here. That means you're constantly picking up, picking up values at the rate of six. So it's at time equal three, it's 18. At time equal four, it's 24. Now, When time is greater than four, see, when time was less than four, it was really a one-part formula. But when time is greater than four, it's a two-part formula. And when it's greater than, you have to do it this way. You do the first part and the second part, which is 24. So after time equal four, it does level off at 24. You don't pick up or lose any more information. And so you get this. If that is your function, that is its interval. Um, this needs a little four on there right there. I don't know why I don't have it. Okay. So these kinds of problems, and there's more subtle ones and things that come upon, but uh, these kinds of problems like um, 4.7, for instance, I didn't assign that one. I think I find 4.8. 4.7 is the, in the book is the kind that really make a difference here, I think. Let's go over to the... Problems. There was problem 4.5 that we just worked, okay? There was that one. Um, you're assigned, I think, for something like 4.8. But this one here, for practice, you should work this one. Particularly this part B. Because that's the kind of thing you come up with a lot in practice. where you're not only integrating a pulse, but you're integrating a pulse times a, a Green's function, a fundamental solution, like a, a dying exponent or something like that. So um, um, I didn't assign this one, but part B of this problem, we'll, you'll see, you'll have to do things like this as you go into you know, system dynamics and you know, you know, various systems where there's an input, say an applied force, and then there's a fundamental response to the solution. Anyway. I think we assigned this one last time. We had a whole lot of trouble with it. Including, so this one was problematic because the students just had a hell of a time with it. But also, as a word of warning, I mean, somebody put an incorrect answer on Chegg for this one. And, you know, a lot of people were submitting the incorrect answer from Chegg. And, um, Anyway, don't do that. And I won't say the other terrible word, but that's a that's right behind it. Well, maybe worse, that thing, Chegg, and all those other, you know, cheating heroes and you know, 
how to cheat the system, how to not do my, how to not think and cheat, you know, sites or whatever those things are called. Horrendous. Okay. Now with that, let's get on to, uh, let's get on to numerical integration. That's, that's the essence of integration. But, give me back here. We want to do numerical inversion. That is, the function we just did, the function we just looked at, was easily integratable by hand, exactly, by observation, really. However, however, in practice, you're going to have a lot of intervals where the integrand f of x is not so compliable with you. Or even, even different is you don't even have a function for f of x, but what you have is data, and you're supposed to integrate data as whatever. You see. Um, so what do you do then where the integral is very complicated? Do you give up? No, when the going gets tough, the tough don't give up. I showed you the little Monty Python thing with the Black Knight, right? Cut off his eye and says, there's a flesh wound, you know, he just kept, you know, you know he's my hero, that guy, you know. Um, when the going gets tough, no, when the going gets tough, the tough go fishing, right? No, I go fishing. But some of you all get tough. And, and this is what this, we want to learn how to do this numerically. That is using that concept of area under the curve, using that concept of a rhyme and sum like thing, okay? So let's go over here. We want the integral of this function between A and B. There's, as we see, it says right there, integral that function between A and B. Let's say the function is not so easy to integrate. It goes up, it goes down. It's a complicated function. Well, you know, big question mark. But don't you agree <clears throat> you could slap a straight line between the endpoints and get a trapezoid? And the area of a trapezoid is easy, isn't it? Because the area of a trapezoid is, is, is the average height, height one plus height two over two times the base, the base times the average height. So the area of this little trapezoid is very easy. The area here might be complicated. So the idea on numerical integration is to say my approximation is the area of this trapezoid. The average height times the base, B minus A. You can look at it and see that there's inaccuracy because the trapezoid is, is giving you not enough. You, clearly you're missing some area there. You got too much there, but it certainly it appears that the area you're missing outweighs the area that you overestimate. And therefore, if it was exactly this problem, would the trapezoid underestimate or overestimate the area? It looks visually like it would underestimate it because you've got this big white area here that's being not accounted for and you've got a little bit to make up for it. So it looks like it's, it's under, in this case, it could be either case. So, the next thing in, 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 in the line of thinking would be that, oh, that did well, a simple function, but a, a, para, a parabola is a simple function also. Where you just use three points like this over here. Now, now you go to a parabola, right? And you say, well, you know, since that works so nicely, why don't I use a parabola? And a parabola needs the three points. So you use the end point, the middle point, the end, and you can from three points, you know, you know how to make a parabola out of three points, you down high school and stuff like that. Um, and so a parabola is still a very easy thing because it's X squared. You can easily integrate an area under a parabola, parabola. And you can see from this graph right here that it looks better because the area here that's being left out seems to be better compensated by the area that's being, being overestimated. So you would expect that the answer with a parabola will be better than the answer with a straight line. Continuing that thinking on, let's use a cubic. You'll now need to use four points, but a cubic. And now you can see that the cubic follows the answer much more, much more tightly. 
So you would think that, well, hell, I'll just use a hundredth order polynomial because polynomials are easy to integrate. And, and in, in practice, that could be done, but there's some practical reasons why we tend to stick to a lower order rule like the trapezoid or the Simpsons and do the following. Don't try to get a, you know, um, I don't try to get a, you know, hundredth order polynomial. What you do is you take, say, a, a trapezoid rule, but break your interval up into smaller pieces. For instance, this, and I'm, I'm using, I'm using the same function. I, I created these plots. There's a function I have on my computer to create this graph. And it's the graph every time. But you can see that it, instead of doing one big crude trapezoid scooped across there, why don't you break it into, say, three sections like this? Break it into three sections and take the trapezoid of each section, you see. This would be called the composite trapezoid because now you're doing, and each tra a trapezoid is easy. It's always easy because it's, you know, a lot of, so now you're adding up three easy things instead of trying to get the really complicated exact thing. And you can see from this picture, the middle, actually the middle piece looks like it's darn good. It looks like this piece misses some, and this piece it certainly looks visually like the composite three trapezoid looks better than one big crude trapezoid. Similarly, with the parabolas, do a set of parabolas parabola in the two sections or, or the three sections I have here. And if you break a problem into three sections and in each section do a parabola, you can see that this three section, a parabola in over three sections is following that curve very tightly. So you would expect this approximation, at least visually, to be darn good. And what you can do is something like, with something like this, instead of using three sections, you could use thousands. And you might say that, that that's a lot of arithmetic. That's, oh my God, that's tedious. That's repetitive. And in fact, it is tedious, it is repetitive, which is exactly the, one of the main motivations for the development of the digital computer is they had these repeated calculations. God, can't we make a machine? You know, it's like a selling line. So we have a machine. So <clears throat> once you get an out, say this thing here, once you get the idea set up and you say, and you say, n equals three, I mean, type in 3000. I mean, the computer doesn't care. It just wails away at it. And, you know, it can do, it can, the computer can do the arithmetic for 3000 in a fraction of a second anyway. So what the heck? So what you do is a trapezoid rule with a very high uh, accuracy, or a Simpsons. And in fact, this, 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 this the quadratic rule is called Simpsons. I guess that's some guy that came up with it or whatever. <clears throat> but often the integrators, the numerical integrators on computers are composite Simpsons rules because you get a lot more bang for your buck. You get a lot more for a parabola and a parabola is still pretty simple to work with but then, so you get that instant accuracy and it's not too hard to add multiple parabolas together. So the composite trapezoid rule, or co excuse me, composite Simpsons use a lot on the integrators. A lot of times though, what you'll find is you have data to work with. You don't have a function. You only have the data points, which means that uh, the composite trapezoid might be better there, especially if the data points are irregularly spaced. So we'll get into all that. We've got a couple more days to work on this thing. For instance, I'm going to show you what the trapezoid rule is, and we're going to develop our own. Let's we'll see what time we got. Enough time to do this right now. Let's do it right now. Oh, God, we're running out of time. Okay. Um, anyway, the net, what's coming up here for the rest of the week is how to do these things. Trapezoid Simpson, how to do them yourself, how to do them for data, and I'll teach you MATLAB's integral integrate command, I think it is, integrate command where it does the function. So it's a nice high level one that's already written for you. So we'll learn all about numerical integration here. And by the time you're done, see, so we'll learn how to do this one, right? That's one of them. And then we're gonna put them together for this one. That's multiple ones. So here we have numerical integration with trapezoids. You break your thing into N pieces. Then this picture has one, two, three, four, five pieces. And you do trapezoids for each piece, and you get a little formula. I'll go over it in more detail. And put it on the, we'll put it on the computer. But you'll have that, which means by the time you're done with this section, 
it's just, you know, if we got two more days scheduled, we can take a little more time if you need it. But we got two more days scheduled. I mean, you will be able to evaluate numerically any interval you'll ever see the rest of your life. No matter how complicated it is. And it, all the other things, so like mean values and this and that and the other thing, you'll be able to do anything about calculus you need the rest of your life including the important task of numerical integration and numerical differentiation. And that's pretty powerful. We couldn't do it without the help of a computer to do the repetitive arithmetic for us and a, and a convenient way to do it, like a MATLAB environment or a mathematical, which I love too. Okay, so there you go. I'm, and and I'm, next time I'll go over the details of this and what we'll do is we'll crank MATLAB up and we'll say, let's do it on MATLAB and we'll have our own little trapezoid integrator and we'll go all the town and we could um, uneven, see uneven spaces, oh God, also you could do one like this, where the data is not even increments of delta T or delta X. It's, you know, a little bit short one and long one, a lot like this. So you know, we want to be able to do these kind too. Data, this is like data might be. Okay, we'll officially, Oh, I guess maybe I should keep that there. Maybe I'll stop share. Hang on. I'll stop share. Class officially over right now, but we will stay on the line if there's questions.